Our subject of this evening is Antakrana, the web of life. The idea or the concept that man is consciousness is correct because only in the ocean of consciousness can we find the answer to problems of time and space, to the continuity of life. Consciousness, however, ocean that it is of infinity is like the most massive computer that was ever built. It has the power to receive the ripples and impressions from untold numbers of people. Cosmic beings, angelic beings, human beings, dwarfs, gnomes, sylphs of the air, elementals of the fire, and beings of the sea, the Andines. In fact, every creature that exists in the universe is able to make its imprint upon this great universal brain or manifestation or the fluid of life or the great cosmic ocean, the universal consciousness field. Everything flows into it and everything flows out of it. This giant computer, which in one sense of the word I would like to call the web of life, not only fills all known space and embraces comprehensively the total stream of time from any conceivable beginning to any conceivable end, in other words, in a vast, continuous circle. It receives every impression and it gives out every impression and it separates the planes of consciousness within its own great and blessed being. In fact, everything from the lowest astral levels and the levels of decomposition physically to the highest levels of God-realization and manifestation, the very height of God himself is recorded in this universal ocean that spans space, exceeds space, and fills the whole stream of time with all of its far-reaching little niches and alcoves and tortuous windings beautiful, isn't it? It's a beautiful concept. In this great concept of this massive circular ocean, the whole law of cycles is included. Nothing then is excluded from this massive computer system. Nothing that is at all can be excluded from it, you see. It has to be there. Unfortunately, the dispersion of consciousness has not been understood by men. They have thought of consciousness as occupying the relative space of the physical brain or the body. They do not quite understand yet, either scientifically or spiritually, the omnipresence of God. Nor do they seem to understand the statute of divine limitations. To illustrate this, Jesus was a friend to Lazarus who was the brother to Mary and Martha. Now, Jesus loved Lazarus with a very deep love, the deepest possible love for the master to have. And when Lazarus died, far away in space from where Jesus was and they didn't have Western Union or any message system, the master possessed the capacity, you must understand, and the capability of having the knowledge that Lazarus was dead. The fact that he had not appropriated that knowledge from the universal ocean of life was shown in the fact that when it was revealed to him, for the first time, he wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is the statement, the little verse, Jesus wept. I know because the ladies 
in the Methodist church where I grew up loved to quote that when they were called upon to give a Bible verse. Jesus wept. They could remember it. So easy. One after another, they get up. Jesus wept. However, the important thing that we derive from that knowledge is that while the master possessed the perfect capability of dipping into the stream and ocean of God's mind, this vast computer that fills time and space and exceeds it all, he did not do it. This in no way was an expression of Jesus' limitation. It did not indicate that Jesus was a limited being at all. He simply was not appropriating the power, the reserve that he already had. He was not appropriating and using it because he was involved in so many divine schemes, so much assistance to mankind that in his own embodied state, he was unable to cope with all of it at once, you see. Rather than say then that we have limited the master, I will say that we have shown the laws of limitations governing embodiments and the fact that when you are an embodiment and engrossed in many things, it is possible that you do not make an attunement or do not receive the impression sent to you from the universal. Now, this does not mean that you're bad, that you're limited, there's anything necessarily wrong with you. It simply shows that the vastness of the whole cosmic scheme can scarcely be realized by flesh and blood and by the limitations thereof. Yet, the Master demonstrated tremendous proficiency, you see. Rather than feel that this limits him, I feel that it comforts us to know that with all of his greatness, he did not always appropriate all of the knowledge the universal held. And this shouldn't make us feel too bad when we consider that the Master Jesus said with his great love ray, the things that I do, ye shall do also, and greater things shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. In other words, because I have lived, because I have loved, because I have given myself to God and developed new systems of communication with the Father, you are going to be able to do greater things because the universal mind will now hold the patterns that I have brought forth in my mission. This is the highest transcendentalism that can be revealed or that up to that time had ever been revealed by any master or any man or any avatar. Since then, men have fulfilled his prediction. They have done greater things than he did. And they too have proceeded back to God. And they are now one with God. And we have their momentum of generated service to add to the power of the Godhead and the power of the Christ and the power of possibility to embodied men. Therefore, in one sense of the word, the pathway to God is easier today because these men lived. The question then before us is, will the pathway be easier tomorrow because you have lived? When I hear people constantly moaning and complaining about how awful their life is, or how everything is going the wrong way for them, or how nobody loves me anymore, and I can't seem to do the right thing, and I'm afflicted and overcome with adversity. I cannot help but feel that these blessed people had better understand that if they are having these experiences, it either means that they are doing something wrong, therefore reaping the karma of the wrong that they're doing, they're cleaning up the karma they made in past embodiments or they're being attacked because of the tremendous service they're rendering to life right now. There's three reasons. So nobody really knows what the reason is, do they? And it's kind of difficult for people to say when someone suffers adversity, well, you're one of these people that is reaping karma from the past or you did something yesterday that brought this on you today but they don't usually do anything else but say that. Very few people will say, oh, well, it must be because you've taken a stand for the light. Well, if you're moaning about this and groaning about this, I don't believe you've taken a stand for the light. 
The people who are taking a stand for the light will never moan and groan at adversity. That's the key that you can use to determine whether or not you are reaping your karma or whether or not it is the karma of the past or the karma of the present, you see. That's the criteria. Are you hollering about it? Are you screaming about it? Are you complaining about it? Are you dumping a burden upon everyone else and feeling so sorry for yourself that you could almost weep? Jesus contributed immensely to the betterment of all humanity upon every system of worlds. And when we are to understand unto Karana, the web of life, it means that what happens within the limited circle is also macrocosmically projected into the larger circle. And if we go to Ezekiel's wheels within wheels, which restates and rephrases and uh, convinces us of the law of cycles. We are able to perceive in that idea that all of these spheres of influence exist in perfect order from the highest circles of cosmos to the lowest little circle of the nucleus of being, our own individual life. Now the blessed master Jesus one time made a statement which riled up his enemies quite a bit. He said, you are whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. You don't enter into the kingdom of heaven yourself and you hinder those who are entering in from entering in. Hard words, but true. You are whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. I used to wonder at that expression until it was revealed to me as to just what it really is. A sepulcher is a place of burial. A whited sepulcher is a place of burial whitewashed by human consciousness to look like it's something else. The dead men's bones within are the failures of consciousness and the engravings of hopelessness and the negative ambitions and despairs of life. These literally record themselves upon our bones. Our forms are distorted by ignorance. Our minds are warped by error. And our consciousness spurns regenerate identity. You need to think about that for a moment in order to understand unto Karana. For Andhakarana is basic to the law of cycles and the law of waves and radiation or radiant energy. Whenever you tremble a spider's web anywhere on the web, the whole web trembles. Therefore, when you're having your little crying spell in Podunk, Kentucky, and you're down there with Moses in the bulrushes or something, and you feel terribly sorry for yourself, just realize that you are adding to the weight of sorrow of your family, of your state and city, of your nation, and of this world, and carrying it a bit farther through onto Karana, the web of life, you are trembling the universe with your vibrations of negativity. If you stop and consider the real truth of this, do you see what an impetus you have for a better life? A lot of people don't mind if they do wrong as long as the wrong is done to themselves. They seem to feel that it is justifiable that they can wrong themselves with impunity but they must not wrong others. This is an error. You are an emanation from the master's molding wheel of life, from the hand of the master potter. God made you, and when he made you, he made you in his image. And your responsibility is to manifest his image everywhere. 
Now we all have erred, and the lives of all men are full of many shames. We know this is true, but that past is prologue. And if we are to emerge as victorious human beings and add to the credit side of the ledger, we must recognize the effect we have upon all life by manifesting negative states and creating indignities in life. We are not our own, as St. Paul said, ye are bought with a price. The price of godhood was paid by the universal Christ mind because when God, the perfection of the perfect cube, descended into form and the triad of spiritual precipitation stood over it in the divine geometry, when God did this, he assumed from the standpoint of the mystery of the law of assumption, the identity of the created. And until you understand that, you do not understand unto Karana. And you should. God assumed your identity. And the only way a transfer could be made of consciousness to you was by God giving you a part of himself. And that took that part of himself out of the universal and put it in the coat of skins of you, in the consciousness, in the identity, in the personality, in every part of you. And in a very real sense, God is crucified in matter. And what is the true meaning of matter? Matter means mater. And here we find that the physical world is the mother of God because God himself impregnates mater with spirit spark identity. Then the womb of mater, of material substance, becomes the generative point for the manifestation of the Christ intelligence of regeneration. We are giving you a branch of the lesser Christian mysteries that has not been expounded upon too much in this world. But it is important because every decree uttered through your lips, every prayer breathed through your being, every benign act, every curbing attempt to control your human appetites, every time you move toward some degree of mastery, you are actively engaged in a service of chiseling out the divine image in physical manifestation where it will be caught up into the heavens and changed in the twinkling of an eye by the Spirit of God into that Christ God universal reality that it already is. The veil of Isis is the dual veil of is, 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 is. It means that that which seems to be and is not. This is the beast referred to in Revelations as that beast which was, the beast which is, and the beast which is to come. The beast which was, of course, is scarcely understood by human beings, but it is the historical man. The beast which is, is man in the state of becoming, and the beast that is to come is man prior to his assumption into his divine identity. Because one moment from the identity of the Godhood, you still embrace a little of the beast until it is finally shed. Somehow or other, I think one of the ways that the dark forces have gained so much control over the mind of men is because they can promulgate the idea that no one is perfect. The moment we began to say, well, no one is perfect, we immediately excuse ourselves and we say, well, charity covers a multitude of sins. 
No one is perfect. And that excuses everything, doesn't it? We can tremble the web of life. We can agitate our neighbors. We can produce vibrations and put them into that cosmic bank, that recorder, within their own plane, you see. And the Lord God placed eastward in Eden a flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life. This beautiful computer, this universal antakarana, this web of life has the beautiful capacity of separating the planes. And thus, the earth plane maintains its own identity. The astral maintains its own identity. Do you know what it means to cancel out a sum upon an adding machine? To punch the figures and they're wrong, they're erroneous, and then clear the whole board with one sweep of the hand? Do you know what it means? It's easier electronically than mechanically, but you can do it both ways. All of these little figures fall back to zero. Well, that's how easy it would be for God to roll up the scroll of all of his creation. He could just clear the board. And every act, and every word, and every thought, and every deed would pass away. What does it say? What did Jesus say? Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall never pass away. Someday then, somewhere, all of these sums, the trembling of the web of life, the depositing of negativity into the body of Antakarana must cease and a clearance of the board occur when the heaven and earth of human thoughts and ideas passes away. But my word shall never pass away. The secret of immortality then is identification with the word, with the Christ image. This is the only way human beings can actually achieve immortality. The brothers of the shadow are quite crafty. They have intelligence. It is the intelligence of the serpent mind. Sinuous, tortuous, twisting, warped, and deceiving. It says you shall not surely die. And many other lies does this carnal mind tell us. But these lies have no power to deceive the soul of God. They cannot deceive the spirit of God that is within us. They only trick the mind. And the mind is the turning point. The mind is the delicately balanced jewel where people can pivot either on error or on truth, as the case may be. And it is the mind that is attacked that ultimately allows the emotions to run away with the pride. the rationale of the mind that authorizes us to accept that which we cannot or should not accept causes us then to cut loose in our emotion. They will say, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Whatever it is, we're going to do it anyway. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. I have received letters from those I sought to help utterly condemning me. Persons who came to me for help asked my help, implored it, and were given it, turned around and said, you told me thus and thus and thus, and what you told me was tyranny. But all I told them was the truth of God's law. The masters do likewise. They continually release truth. And you know what happens to us individually if we spurn the truth that they offer us? Well, I'm going to tell you. The biggest, the worst punishment that happens is not given by them. It's given by cosmic law. And it means I will cut them off from thy fount of wisdom. After the universal has given us so many precepts of knowledge, and then we have spurned that knowledge again and again and again. After a while, the cosmic law steps in and says, all right, you have had the knowledge for your freedom, 
and you have rejected it. Now we are going to cut you off and we are not going to give you any more instruction. You're going to have to find out the hard way. Beat your head against the wall. Let the world be your guru. Find out through the hardness of the law and the return of your own karma just what you are producing by your acts and conduct. People looking at this say, my, the law is hard. Not so. The law is extremely gentle. For I think that if the law were to continue always in gentility, ultimately people would go the broad way that leads to destruction and say, well, we will carry on as we have because we enjoy it. And it won't make any difference to us. We've got lots of time. Don't you know that God is eternity? Why do you have to go ahead and bother about getting perfected now? Why, that's a hard job to get perfected. You might have to give up something. You might have to change something. You might have to change an idea. Maybe it'll be a bit uncomfortable to change. After all, you might be thought funny by someone. And you know those three score and ten, of which most of us live out twenty years before we even know we're alive, is gone by so quickly. It's the first thing you know. You're 20, and then you're 40. And then you start moving the other way because the time you get to 80, you know, well, it's 23 skidoo for most people, unless they're real good students of the masters. And then we have several of them that seem to survive to 90 and up to 100. They still haven't equaled Methuselah, have they? We're coming back now to the truth of life. We have to take a stand someplace, somewhere for the honesty of the law. And as long as the enemy can trick us and say, well, you're not perfect, he can keep excusing anything you do. We have people in this town that have come up here and heard the master's dictations. They know that something wonderful is taking place and they've told us so. But where are they on Saturday night or Sunday night? Many times these same people are in a restaurant somewhere, maybe down to Canyon City or somewhere, having lunch, or they're watching a television program. They're not here decreeing, and they don't realize that in any sudden moment they may be catapulted out of the body into the astral realm. Well, we have classes here, and if we have enough interest, we would have more classes. Now, we are growing and we are getting more interest and we're going to have more classes. But our classes do give training in what to expect at the change called death and how to prepare for your ascension and cheat death if you can. Some people will definitely be able to cheat death in this embodiment if they continue on their present course. Others will not. They will have another embodiment and some will have more than one. But whatever the case, the knowledge of how to act and behave in the spiritual world, the knowledge of what to do with your spiritual body when you have vacated this body, the knowledge of how to bring yourself to waking consciousness, to how to start the balancing process from inner levels that will help you to work out a little of your karma between embodiments. All this is vital to your existence. These things take time. I have seen people who in an accident where their body is laying there dead and they suddenly stand beside their body and look down on it is a situation unparalleled in their life. It's like the Jewish Sheeney's horse where he come up to the door and he says, my horse just died, he never did that before. <laughs> well, you never died before. So here you are dead and you're looking at your body. You still are conscious. You know your name. You know where your family is. You see the car. You see everything. But you can't move. You just stand and look at it. It's like the instant told by Norman Vincent Peale in one of his a guideposts one time where the man cracked up in the airplane and his spirit went way up in the air about 200 feet and he's looking down at his body. He sees the plane. He watches. They cut the fence and they come across the field. His wife's way out at the highway coming in in her car and she's running over toward the plane and one man over there says, I bet he was drunk. Pretty soon he starts going down toward his body and he gets close to it, he gets in his body and then he feels like he's whirling around like when you're on the operating table before you go out with ether. He starts whirling around the next thing you know he blinks his eyes. He's looking up and he sees that woman in the crowd that said, I bet he was drunk. He looked up at her and he says, I was not drunk. 
And she gets scared because she knows that she was way over in the field 200 yards away. So she runs away and the man lives. But you see, the circumstances involved here are real. And I think that the fact that we survived uh, the body, that we survived death, should be a vital factor to people. I think it would be a lot more interesting as far as atheism goes if uh, people didn't survive, they could say, well, good. When the end comes, it comes. So let us eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. It doesn't make any difference if you're not going to live again. If you're just going to snuff it all out, well, it doesn't matter. That is, ethics do not matter. How you treat your neighbor doesn't matter. Let's get all the good we can get according to the human idea of materialism because we only live once and when we're dead, we're dead and that's all. That's real good, isn't it? But it isn't so. People do re-embody and they do have a period and span between embodiments and they do pass through astral terrors. The so-called statement of Jesus, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor permit thine holy one to seek corruption, reference the fact that God would not allow his soul or his spirit to actually abide and dwell in the astral hordes, the realm of hell. And the purgatory spoken of by the Catholic Church and the hell spoken of by the Christian Bible is basically the astral realm, especially the lower astral realm. And if you want to get an idea what some of the creatures look like that dwell there, go over to France and look at the gargoyles on the cathedrals. That will give you some idea of what you will see in the astral hell. And this is what men see when they get delirium tremens. When they get the DTs and get good and drunk, they see that astral realm and the veil is thinned and that's what they dwell in and they go mad. They run absolutely berserk. They climb the walls. They put them in straight jackets. They're almost insane and they are in fact insane. Now this is the realm that we are trying to show you how to get out of and stay out of. Because someday you know very well according to statistics you're either going to go up or you're going to go down. And the up and down here that we're referencing is either you're going to ascend or you're going to just be buried. And if you're buried, your spirit is still there. And your being and consciousness can very well be awake, as it is in some cases. Some people die and go to sleep and don't know anything for weeks and months or maybe years. Others die and they are wide awake. And you have to learn how to guide yourself so that you can be a master of antakarana. This is better than karate. <laughs> in karate, you can fight off the denizens of the crime world, you see, unless they have a gun, which is supposed to be a great equalizer. But in the world of antakarana, the world of the spirit, in order to master that realm, you have to have some knowledge of that realm. Jesus had knowledge. That's what the mystery schools were supposed to teach. But you see, the dark forces don't want that. They just love the innocent little neophyte who comes out of the body and stands there and says, gee, I don't know where I am or who I am. And they say, well, we'll tell you who you are. Come and follow us. And there they are, waiting to try to vampirize that person and take them over and lead them down the spiral negative pathway. I'm sorry that these are the facts of life. I'm very, very sorry. But this is the only way that a God could give man Godhood, was to put him in a free will situation. And it is our misuse of the free will that has put us into this situation, you see, and nothing else. Some people argue and say, well, God has all power. Why doesn't he just go ahead and pass a law? that all of our sins would be wiped out immediately and that we would be perfect. And why do we have to go through all of this in order to experience this? Well, dear hearts, remember that God is going through it with you. He is crucified in matter. Remember that. This should give you a tremendous comfort because the only way that your soul could ever be immortalized is to have the divine companion right, right, right within you. That divine companion is the mold of the Christ. That's the divine image. The divine image is there. And by conformity to it, you become one with the universal Christ and you attain your true spiritual identity. But in the meantime, what is really happening in the world is this. That all over the world, the tyrants like the Hitlers and the Mussolinis and all these people 
are doing these control factors and they're trembling the web of life and demanding their pound of flesh like Shylock of old in the Merchant of Venice. Oh, they all want to control something. Knowledge is power, they say. Well, it is. And the wrong kind of knowledge is the wrong kind of power and the right kind of knowledge is the right kind of power. So Antakarana is basically a most magnificent concept because it shows that all of the myriad planes of identity function within their own ideational levels. And when you climb the ladder of life, you climb from plane to plane to plane to plane till you reach the highest. And that's why these masters have the knowledge they have is because they've gone through all these planes and they just keep right on going up. And there wouldn't be much incentive for them to keep climbing if there was nowhere to climb to. If they could go up and just sit down on the right hand of God and have dinner, well, this would be a very easy and simple thing. But the nature of God is transcendental. And God himself transcends himself each day that exists. The God of today is actually in one sense not the God of yesterday because God himself is evolving through the creation. Now, I know that may sound blasphemous to some people who have the idea that God is already created. Well, they also had the idea that the world was already created in seven days and that God is now resting somewhere. That is erroneous too. Because the perfect creation, finish then thy perfect creation, pure and sinless, let it be, do you see? Finish then thy perfect creation. This means that the perfect creation of God was made in the mind of God in the seven days of creation, the seventh day being the day of rest and completion or finality. But that is in the dual nature of God, that is in one sense the night side of God to us because it is the invisible realm that holds the pattern. And when we bring it forth in the figure eight, in the configuration of the eight, into the physical manifestation. Then it returns back to spirit ultimately, you see. But it first has to come forth and the divine matrix has to encompass it round about. Oh, these things are deep, I know. But you can't understand a spider's web, can't you? You've seen a spider's web. You can understand that the web of the universe is vast. That it covers all the known and unknown cosmos everywhere. You can understand that what trembles one part of life trembles another. You can understand that everyone who teaches Christ, who preaches Christ, who glorifies Christ, who lifts up God, who exhibits faith, you understand? Faith. They enhance creation, don't they? For all of us. You see. And every part of life is blessed by that. And everyone who curses life by saying, I want to end it all. I don't want any part of it. I'm going to commit suicide. I'm not getting anything out of it. Well, you're not putting anything into it either. And that's basic truth. People who are busy putting something into life don't have time to even die. They're too busy. I've heard quite a few of them say, I'm just staying around to cheat the undertaker. <laughs> I've never heard any of them say that they were staying around to cheat the uptaker, though. I think they're staying around to please the uptaker. And the uptaker is our own divine God presence who takes us up and changes us from glory to glory even by his own spirit. So now then, in conclusion, can you not see that all of the mysteries of God are in this beautiful computer, this infinite ocean? Can you not see that all good and all evil is deposited in there, in its plane, can you not see that the sword of truth that God put between Eden, which is the higher planes and the lower planes where identity is being worked out, remains there to separate the error of man from the perfection of God so that there is no contamination above? Can you not see then that this pure state above is the goal of us all, that this state below is the school of us all, that the two-edged sword remains to separate it and that in that which is below the two-edged sword the law of cause and effect functions primarily, that there the web of life is trembling in its negative way as well as its positive way. 
But above, all good is added to the church daily, even as the souls of men are added to the church universal and triumphant daily. See, all good goes above and accrues, but all evil becomes mere record, cause, effect, record, and memory here below, below the realm of the sword. But the sword is eastward in Eden, eastward meaning within. And within here, referencing not just simply the inside of your body, but the inside of consciousness. Jesus said, you cleanse the outside of the platter. You cleanse the outside of the form, but the inside is full of dead men's bones. Do you see? And this is what we call psychic episode. The divine director told me one time, he said, you know, Mark, every single program on television Every book that is written, every novel, is psychic episode. I think he put that in one of his pearls, too, if I remember right. But he told me this. He said, it's psychic episode. It's somebody's life pattern in an imperfect state. It's not a perfect state in most cases. They're writing about people and their mistakes and their heartaches and their triumphs, too, sometimes. But always human. You know how they have that Horatio Alger series where... The boy wins his fortune in the big city. Well, all of these books, everything that's written is all psychic episode. And it all brings us into a point of interest about human beings. But what's going to happen if we just fill ourselves with that garbage? Ultimately, we're going to be more and more human and less and less divine. And we're interested in getting out of it. So I don't say that there are not interesting stories on television and in movies and in radio that cannot act as a diversion, I have heard, although I don't know if it is true or not, that the late Paramahansa Yogananda used to love to read Wild West stories as a diversion. I have heard that one of the great masters, who is now ascended, I'd rather not name him because he was here on earth not too long ago, used to enjoy going to movies once in a while, because it was a relief for him. But I really think that if he were here today and saw the type of diet that he'd get in the movies, he would have a hard time finding one. On board ship, I walked out of Magnificent Millie or the Thoroughly Modern Millie or something like that. I walked out of that. I had enough almost as soon as I got in. I just thought I'd see what it was like to see a theater on board ship and to rock along the waves while you're looking at the movies. But... I think that by this understanding of antakarana, by our understanding of how we as individuals can hurt life by what we think or help life by what we think, we can see an enormous potential for good. Can you imagine the thought power of a million people concentrating on the betterment of their community if they lived in a city? Tremendous, wouldn't it be? You imagine the thought power of healing that a little group can engage in. You probably may remember the time they projected the heart attack at me. And the doctor said I had one, one notch out of five that was hanging. All the rest of my heart was destroyed. I had one muscle left. Well, I got up here and delivered a dictation the next night. Did you know that? It was unheard of. Unheard of. People just don't do that. And they took a reading afterward, and he says, well, I can't understand it. He says, your heart seems very good. Well, they can project anything at you, anything. So you see, by this understanding of Anna that right where you are is the center of the universe. As far as you are concerned, your heart is the center of the universe, and you, tremble the whole universe from that point in space where you are. And every other person has their own center that connects. And actually, in one sense, it's like the teacher with the eyes in the back of her head. The light rays that go out from your heart and connect you with the whole universe flow terrifically. Terrifically. I mean, they flow out around the whole globe. They don't just go out like these rays here on a flat plane. They go out in all directions. Do you understand? Like a light bulb. No matter which angle you're looking down or up at it, they're always 
emitting energy. When you light a candle up on top of Pike's Peak over here, if you were millions of light years away from the Earth, if you had a powerful enough telescope, you should be able to see that because once the light rays begin to travel from that candle, small as it is, they never stop traveling. They just keep going out in the universe. Actually, they curve in, if you really want to know, and they come back to the source. They are circular. But they travel an awful long ways before the curve is made. I'm telling tales out of school, the curvilinear universe. But at the same time, this demonstrates law of cause and effect that brings back to you almost on a roller coaster every thought and everything that you think. And this is why the field of consciousness is the field of identity. And the field of consciousness is able to have what we call the night and day side. The night side of consciousness can, uh, for example, we call it night side because we can't perceive the light that's in it. And the night side of consciousness can reach out as far as God reaches every way and then come back. But the day side of consciousness, which is the side that we call the day side, but they call that the night side and the other the day side, you see. The day side of consciousness may be no bigger than a walnut for some people. You know what I mean? It's very small. They haven't gone out very far in their imagination. The action of being has not expanded in the antakarana of cosmic magnificence. And this is a very important point that illustrates why one star differs from another star in glory. It's because although all men have in the antakaranic dual pattern the complete manifestation of the seven days of creation. They have probably not got to the first hour yet as far as the first day of creation is gone for their outer manifestation. And you will find in measuring people that they range all the way from the first hour of the wailing lusty cosmic infant to the old mature man with a long white beard in the seventh cycle of life, just about ready to go upstairs and join St. Germain and Jesus. Now where you are, I don't know. It's like that old saying, around she goes and where she stops, nobody knows. I don't pretend to know exactly where everyone is. I have a good idea if I take a spectrum of the aura and analyze it. I don't have time to do it. I'm not curious about each one of you. I don't care. In the sense that I want to be curious, I care in the sense that I want to help everyone. But certainly not just to peek into your world and say, peekaboo, <laughs> here I am, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> when you once taste of human vanity in yourself, you've had enough. You don't have to look in somebody else's mind to be able to realize what human beings think. And if you get to that stage, then you say, God help me that I can be able to get acquainted with the Masters and begin to think some of the Masters' thoughts. Must have been wonderful to have been in the mind of Jesus when he was raising Jairus' daughter. Wouldn't you like to have had the experience? Well, you know you can through assumption. You can assume the identity of any ascended Master. Did you know that? But be very careful when you do this. Just don't go around and tell people that you're Napoleon or somebody. They have a habit of locking these people up. And people that run around and say, I'm Jesus. Well, they lock those people up too. Or they cart them away with the little white coats, you know. But it doesn't hurt to be able to conceive of the Christ identity as your own. You can claim the identity of St. Germain. You can claim it in its essence. And let it be a guiding star to your life to expand your consciousness into the Master's consciousness. This is the trembling of Antakarana according to the initiatic process. This is how you gain. You gain the master's consciousness by assuming his identity. The only thing is don't try to tell somebody else that you are the master. Just appreciate the fact that you can assume the identity and as you do it, you will get some of the master's assistance into your world because you tune in with his vibration by doing it. Now I've given you a secret. Good night.